Welcome to Big Blend Radio with Nancy and Lisa, the mother-daughter travel team and publishers of Big Blend magazines. Uh, Today is our first Military Monday show. Of course, we've been covering military issues, military history for a number of years, I think since day one when we started over 14 years ago. But today we're excited to announce that this is our very first Military Monday show. We are going to be airing episodes every first Monday of the month. So uh, today, if we're going to kick off some military history and a Military Monday show, we've got to have Military Mike on the show with us. Military Mike is Mike Guardia. He is an award-winning author, historian, uh, the number of books that just keep racking up with him with what he does. And I encourage you to go to his website, MikeGuardia.com. He's one of our Big Blend experts and also a partnering in military history, in regards to our Love Your Park store, where Nancy and I travel the country documenting parks and public lands. But um, with Mike now, we're out there getting military history as we travel, especially generals, uh, following in the generals' footsteps. And today we're going to touch on Operation Desert Storm. This is uh, the, 30, the 30th anniversary of Operation Desert Storm. On January 16, 1991, President George H.W. Bush announced the start of it. And He's here to join us to talk about it. He's got an upcoming book about Operation Desert Storm. But this ties back to our tour because we used to live in 29 Palms. We just came back through from 29 Palms. We were there earlier in 2020. We were there for three months, (laughs) sheltered in place. And uh, this is a military town, and they also have an amazing public art project, over 60 pieces of public art throughout this town. And uh, two of the murals are part of Operation Desert Storm. I'm going to say the the Gulf War. So Mike can explain a little bit more of that part of uh, the Gulf War, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. I mean, I get a little confused, as you all know. But anyway, welcome back, Military <laughs> Mike. How are you? Hey, ladies. I'm doing great, and it's great to be on the show, as always. Hey, Thank always you. good to have you back here. So 30-year mm-hmm. anniversary of Operation Desert Storm. Um, right. Okay, Dude, how did it happen? How did that happen so fast? Seriously, 1991 was a big year for me. That was my (laughs) high school graduation. Now you all know how old I am. Like, seriously. Uh (laughs) That is not right. But (laughs) I'm still young at heart here. But, um, yeah, you were posting this on your author page on Facebook. So, everyone, Mike Mm -hmm. Guardia, author, uh, you're posting photos. You started this um, from the actual um, anniversary, right, that you're posting a photo a day? Awesome. I sure am. I sure am. Wow. It's uh yeah, it's a it's an ongoing it's an ongoing photo collage uh that I'm doing mm-hmm. on my Facebook author page, uh pretty much straddling January and February of this year. Um every day or almost every day I'll be posting content that is commemorating the UN's victory against Saddam Hussein in that conflict. Mm-hmm. And uh mm-hmm. yeah. That cool. that's what really let it off was the UN like he didn't like he he was supposed to you know behave himself by a certain date and he didn't and then George Bush said that's it because isn't it about oil <laughs> this whole war was about oil right well in a matter of speaking it was and really to understand the genesis of the Gulf War uh, you really have to wind the clocks back about ten years before it actually kicked off um, as a matter of fact I think it would be better if we uh, wound the clock back about 12 years prior to that because oh. uh, one of the things that I think really I think really uh, touched it off was the Iranian revolution um, mm-hmm. that of course was the fall of the Shah of Iran and the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini and mm-hmm. uh, you know if you uh, if you take a look at that region of the world um, after the uh, after the downfall of of the Nasser regime in Egypt uh, you really had Iran and Iraq uh, jockeying to become the dominant force in the Middle East. Uh, the uh, the Shah of Iran was really trying to flex his muscles, and you know he was establishing a close friendship with the U.S. But of course, the uh, Shah of Iran he gets deposed, and he is overthrown by the Ayatollah Khomeini, who establishes the Islamic Republic of Iran and uh, makes it into an Islamic theocracy. Well, here's where Saddam Hussein really starts to enter the picture. Um, For about a decade at that point, uh, he had been slowly rising as the de facto leader of Iraq. And he finally Mm. consolidates uh, all of his power in the late 1970s. Uh, But Saddam himself is a secular leader. And he looks across Mm. the border to Iran and he says to himself, okay, 
the Ayatollah Khomeini and all of his acolytes, and most of the Iranians for that matter, they are predominantly Shiite Muslims. Mm-hmm. But I myself, Saddam mm-hmm. Hussein, I am a Sunni Muslim, and I am a secular leader who is in charge of a population that is largely Shiite Muslims themselves. So if I look at what's going on across the Iranian border, and if the Shah of Iran fell that quickly to a Shiite revolution, how easy would it be for me to fall to a similar Shiite revolution? Hmm. So in uh, so uh, in whatever warped brain cells he was using at the time, he says, okay, yeah. well, in order to uh, preempt a Shiite rebellion within my own borders, the yeah. best way to prevent that is to launch a preemptive strike against the Islamic Republic of Iran and uh, initiate a war with them and hopefully – Due to wow. the destabilization of the Iranian revolution, it will be a quick and easy victory for the Iraqi army and the Iraqi Air Force. Mm. And I'll be able to claim victory and I will be able to demonstrate not only to the Middle East, but, you know, to broader Muslims around the world, you know, the superiority of my secular regime and, in a sense, the superiority of the Sunni Muslim way of thought. So he does this. He kicks off the Iran-Iraq war in September of 1980, and uh, he invades. Uh, The Iraqi military actually makes uh, pretty quick advances because the Iranians were not expecting this at all. But he makes a uh, a very, uh, very bad miscalculation, kind of similar to the miscalculation Hitler made when he invaded Mm -hmm. the Soviet Union. Uh, the mm-hmm. Iranians are fiercely patriotic, and uh, yeah, they may they may or may not fully have uh, you know trust and confidence in the in the Ayatollah's government, but uh, nobody invades their homeland and gets away with it. Yeah. So they pretty much all rally to the new Islamic theocracy, and uh, they take up arms against the invading Iraqis. And from that point, it uh, it very quickly devolves into a stalemate. You know, the war started in 1980, but by around 1984, uh, it, it was pretty much deadlocked um, between the two sides, and they were just making minor advances against the other. Well, the stalemate continues on well into the late 1980s until finally both sides are just exhausted from fighting. Neither side is really able to get the upper hand against the other. And uh, the U.N. brokers a peace agreement. And in 1988, uh, the Iran-Iraq war officially comes to an end. Mm -hmm. Uh, Both sides have ended the war in a stalemate. Both sides have pretty much agreed that the war was an even draw. But uh, Saddam Hussein is in a real financial bind at this point. Um, (laughs) The eight-year war against Iran has plundered a lot of the antebellum wealth that Iraq had. Uh, Going into the Iraq war, um, uh, Iraq had a a cash reserve of something to the tune of like $50 billion. And uh, by the end of the war, uh, they were several billion dollars in debt. Now, most of the most of the war debt had actually been financed by Kuwait, um, you know, because he Hmm. was running out of money and his oil revenues could only pay for so much. So he borrowed uh, he borrowed billions upon billions of dollars from Kuwait and the Kuwaiti government, yeah, they uh, they expected him to pay back every cent that he mm-hmm. took. Well, you know, Saddam is sitting there in 1988 and 1989, mm-hmm. and he's looking at his finances, and uh, he's looking at the devastation that this has uh, caused his country. He's several billion dollars in debt to his tiny little neighbor to the south, and he's telling himself, well, I can't reasonably pay all this off. And uh, the situation, the economic situation in my country is such that uh, it would take uh, years for me to even pay, probably not even in my lifetime, be able to pay this off. So I'm going to go for the quick and easy solution. I'm going to invent a pretext to invade Kuwait. If I can't repay my debt, I'm just going to take over Kuwait and I'm going to annex all of their oil fields. So what he does uh, to that effect is he says, you know, he says – To all of his Arab brothers, he says to all of the fellow nations in OPEC, he says, I think Kuwait is deliberately keeping the price of oil low, and I I, I accuse them of producing below OPEC quotas so that that, uh, OPEC won't be able to generate as much income. And then he also says, yeah, and then he also says, yeah, Kuwait, you've been slant drilling my oil. And Kuwait says, what are you talking about? Come on, man. No, we haven't. What are you doing? 
and mm. to uh to uh to further you know to further his uh to further his his pretext he also ignites a long standing border dispute between Iraq and Kuwait he says Kuwait you see your border as existing on this particular parallel at this particular grid coordinate well no i think the border is actually here so anybody who is paying attention to what's going on can pretty much see that he's just trying to invent reasons to invade his neighbor to the south and it was around this time that wow. uh you know that he starts that he starts a saber rattling he starts mobilizing his forces to the border and uh the US ambassador at the time was a lady named April Glasby she approaches him and sh- she says okay Saddam uh, in the spirit of friendship, not the spirit of confrontation, please tell me what your intentions are regarding Kuwait. Uh, you know, you've been making all these threats, you've been making all these accusations on the international stage, and now I see that you're massing your uh, forces so close to the Kuwaiti border. Please tell me what your intentions are. And he said, he said to her that uh, he was committed to finding a peaceful solution and that he was uh, that he was meeting with Kuwaiti envoys either in Riyadh or Cairo, and that uh, the solution was going to be one that was going to be brokered by the Arab League. Hmm. And and April Glasby told him either in that same conversation or in a follow up conversation that we have no opinion of Arab Arab conflicts. Now here's hmm. where a little bit of controversy starts to come in. Some people have interpreted that as April Glasby giving Saddam the green light to go ahead and invade Kuwait. But that's actually not what she did. She was acting according to State Department policy at the time because, hmm. the, because the State Department had a longstanding policy, and they, uh, they drilled this into all of their diplomats. They said the U.S. does not take sides in border hmm. disputes between two of its allies. They say oh, we don't yeah. take sides in border disputes. They mm. say if Kuwait is an ally and Iraq is an ally and they're having a border dispute, you let That's them handle okay. the dispute. But we, we, we do not take sides in that. And you yeah. have to remember, at the time, we actually did consider Iraq to be a close ally in the Middle East. If for no other reason, then we had a common enemy in uh, the Ayatollah mm. Khomeini. Yeah. So, so uh, Saddam, you know, whether, you know, he got the green light from April Glasby or not, or, you know, whatever anybody told him, he was going to invade Kuwait anyway. You know, if he didn't mm. have a reason, he was going to invent a reason. And, uh, you know, he flexed his muscles and he dared the world to stop him. And he was very confident that his army, and you have to remember, even though Iraq is comparatively a small country, they had the fourth largest army in the world at the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And uh, it, it was also the largest army in the Middle East, so he was certain that if uh, that if he did invade Kuwait, that his army was going to make very short order of any yeah. rescue force that came to liberate the Kuwaitis, and he was also on the record saying that America is a society that cannot accept ten thousand dead in one battle, because the memories of Vietnam were as galvanizing to Saddam Hussein as they were disheartening to the American public. He said, if America comes to try and liberate Kuwait, all I have to do is fight them in one battle, and after they suffer a few thousand casualties, they're going to sue for peace on my terms. Because I was paying attention to what happened in Vietnam, and I don't Mm. think the Americans can really stomach a large-intensity conflict. So uh, August 2nd, 1990, that's when uh, Mm. the Iraqi army starts an 80-mile blitzkrieg right into the heart of Kuwait City. And within a matter of only 48 hours, all of Kuwait was under Iraqi control. And he says, I am annexing Kuwait as a brand new Iraqi province, and all of its oil reserves are now within my control. Now, that move that he did to annex Kuwait, that put him in charge of anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of all of the world's known oil reserves Mm -hmm. at the time. And then he started massing his board, then he started massing uh, his forces along the Saudi Arabian border to the point where the king of Saud, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the Saudi royal family called up the U.S. and said, uh, hey, we have a very threatening, menacing Iraqi army that is massing along our borders. Can you please send some help? Mm. Wow. As a deterrent hey, wow. in case there's any further aggression. But, th- but this was also, so there's that, but then... All of this also made it that 
you've got to look at the the oil supply from a global perspective, right? So America right. did have a vested interest in that part. If Hussein took over Iraq's oil supply, then we'd be kind of screwed, right? In a way, like when you look at it, it that wasn't that part of the whole thing for us to say, hey, you can't you can't own it all. It's like a monopoly, <laughs> you know, on the oil. Well, it, it wasn't so much a business aspect as it was, you know, hey, if we, uh, you know, if we, if we let a madman let, like Saddam Hussein oh, take over the yeah, entire Middle that. East, and mm-hmm. you know, he, uh, you know, and he pretty much monopolizes all of the oil within OPEC, you know, it, it's it's not really we're not we're not necessarily looking at it from a business standpoint. Yeah, it's more uh, it, it's it's more of a function of, hey, this brutal dictator, you know, has to, uh, you know has to respect the sovereignty of these other countries and he can't and, just run roughshod over the Middle East. And right. the dictatorship and we, thing is it's scary. I mean, they they end up, that's when slave labor comes in that, I mean, that whole, yeah. the whole dictatorship thing is, you know, even the, when, when that happens, the whole, you know, protect the women and children goes out the window. Everybody is fair game at that point. And I mm-hmm. think this is where dictatorship and um, communism gets like this whole thing. Like that, it's like, I, oh, did I say that? And now everyone's going to freak out. <laughs> you know that whole word. But it's it. There's it. You can't have one person run everything. And a dictatorship is a scary thing because then that's you know I can kill everybody and and go right back to what Hitler did. Um, but they are mm-hmm. making mistakes, like you were saying. Like when you came on the show. Um, what a couple months ago, talking about air war on the Eastern Front, your your latest book, we were talking about how you know Hitler just totally didn't think that hey the the Russians can do this and that, um, and they did with their air force, and they had women fighter pilots in there that were amazing, but when you think about now with this dictatorship thing, you I know I don't want to jump the gun, but when Twenty Nine Palms when those guys took him down, they took that statue down. They're like. And here we are in America mm-hmm. with this whole statue issue. They took it and drove, they they ran through the streets with that statue. They, I mean, that was a huge mm-hmm. deal because it was like signifying the dictator has been taken down. You know, that was it. Um, so I think it's important, but there's that business side too. But it is about the people at the end of the day. Like even now in our country, we look at all these big uh, conglomerates. You know, there's these huge corporations and if we don't have competitiveness, then you get a weird dictator in a business front. And that's not good for the employees or for the, the mm. people in the country who end up not making the money that they should. Um, and it's scary. Africa, Nancy, right? You had cho- child soldiers. Mm-hmm. They, they they gave them drugs. They did all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. sorry, I just, when you say the word dictator, I kind of rant out. No, but I think, I think they also, don't we have agreements with other countries? This happens over here, then we're supposed to do this over there. I do think we have agreements with other countries, our allies, that we're supposed to right. fulfill. And we, we mm-hmm. expect them also to fulfill their agreements with us. But being the power that America has, yeah, we're. I think we're always on the front lines, and we have agreements and promises that we want to fulfill because we don't want to be known as a country that doesn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it, and I think it's important. Yeah, you know, and I think that the agreements that we have with other countries were made for the safety of all. Yeah, you know? so it, it it's a thing that we have to do even though some people you know like when Vietnam happened I remember you know Vietnam was a big deal when I was in in school and uh, should we go and some people protested other people like no we have to because we had an agreement with the French and I was like okay well, I, I, y- yeah good. you know that we would protect them I don't know if they would run to protect us but we said we would, so you know your word is your bond, and that's how it rolls. I, you know, I feel like we had this uh, international persona of the country that would stand by our word, and that's what mm-hmm. we did in a lot of aspects. Whether you agree with it or you don't, the agreements were made 
before we were even born, some of them. Right. Yeah. I mean, some of these agreements with countries were, they're like years old. I think I think World War One and World War Two really kind of did that, right, Mike? In a way, like we're unified, we're going to stand by. We're, mm-hmm. It's honor, right? Do we talk about honor and glory? Yeah. You don't get the glory without the honor and actually going through the, the, the the action of it. Um, mm-hmm. So I think I mean this is it. Just it, this whole war. I mean, it really is the Gulf War, right? In a way, with I just got to go back on this because here's this whole thing with Saddam Hussein, and he's being a dictator and a greedy, greedy dictator, you know. And then he screwed up with his his money. And and wars take as you were talking about the wars before between him and you know the Iran and Iraq border wars going on for so long. My first thing was like, how much is that draining both countries? You know, it, it, economically, it's got to just be horrific. However. The Gulf War, this is what got me. I went down a rabbit hole today, getting prepared for this, and I went, oh, my gosh. Okay, so there's the Gulf War. We always talk about the Gulf War. So the Gulf War really is this long, big battle with little ba- – not little, I don't want to say that, but battles in – like there's it's, – it's, it's like the Civil War, and then there's like this battle at Gettysburg, this battle here, right? So these are all specific like Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm – there's a saber. These are all specific battles, all under the blanket of the Gulf War. Am I getting that right, or have I lost it? <laughs> I need help on this. Pretty much. To understand this. Pretty much, yeah. So Operation Desert Shield was the first part of the Gulf War. That was uh, when we had an occupation footprint in Saudi Arabia. And well, I really shouldn't say occupation. We were, we were there as a peacekeeping force, uh, mm. as a deterrent, really, as a shield against mm. any potential aggression from the Iraqis uh, should they decide to invade the kingdom of Saud. Uh, so we were there, and we were there as a deterrent against any further aggression. That was Desert Shield from August of 1990 until January of 91. And when Saddam uh, missed his deadline to withdraw from Kuwait, that's when Operation Desert Shield became Operation Desert Storm. And then you had Operation Desert Storm uh, that lasted from uh, January 17th of 1991 until February 28th, which is when the ground war ended. Then a few days later, you had the official ceasefire that was that that was brokered. So that's generally regarded as uh, as the end of the Persian Gulf War right there. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you had the no-fly zones. You had the uh, you had the border watch missions in Kuwait for nearly a decade after that, until you know the start of the second Gulf War, you know the Iraq mm-hmm. War. And uh, yeah, so it's uh, it, it's it's wars that are separated by you know that are separated by different parts of the timeline and different operations. Okay. Okay, so then it's still the same, like they're still in the same issue in a way, but it had to be like Operation Desert Storm. Because even when I was looking at the murals and I emailed you, I'm like, you're doing this project. Let's do this. Look at these murals here. They're they're in, in 29 Palms. And I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. wait a minute. Isn't this the same words? No, I got all confused. I'm like, okay, dude, I need some help. But um, that's what's in- – well, because you say then there's a second Gulf War. And, and when we lived in 29 Palms, it's like it's, it's this – I remember men and women going back on multiple tours, like they would be mm-hmm. gone and come home like not very long, and then they'd be out, off again. Is this the same kind of thing that happened with the Gulf War? And the first, you said there's a second one. I'm trying to put it all into a big perspective. <laughs> we can okay. yeah, understand it. Yeah. 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 So after the end of the first Gulf War, I mean, let's say that March 1st, 1991 is the official end of the first Gulf War. Okay. So that's when, that's when the Gulf War ended. And then after that, you had uh, several border missions um, in Kuwait where the U S would send troops to do exercises along the Kuwaiti border uh, mm-hmm. just to keep a presence there in case the mm-hmm. Iraqis ever wanted to ever got the bright idea to invade Kuwait again. Uh, mm-hmm. So you had you had uh, you had those exercises that were going on for 
really, really throughout most of the 90s. And then while you had those operations on the Kuwaiti border, you also had um, you also had missions along what was called the Iraqi No Fly Zones, and that was Operation Northern Watch and Operation Southern Watch. And uh, what NATO aircraft would do is they would patrol the Iraqi No Fly Zones to make sure that uh, Saddam's mm-hmm. Air Force wouldn't send up any planes into the restricted zones. And uh, that those operations that I just mentioned, the border tours along Kuwait mm-hmm. and the uh, and the no fly zone missions, uh, those aren't considered part of the Gulf War. That's considered after the Gulf War. You know, that's just like okay. a, those are just uh, those are just like contingency operations that we've done. And then those contingency operations continued until March of 2003, when we started Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, colloquially also known as the Second Gulf War. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm getting it because it was it, yeah, and that's that was the one when when the um they took down the the statue of Saddam Hussein was the second one then in Operation mm-hmm. Iraqi Freedom. Okay, I'm getting myself together here. Well, it it <laughs> it's, it's an ongoing <laughs> thing, right? I mean, you know, it's and you know when you talk to people. I know we were talking to friends about, hey, we're going to do this conversation, this interview, and everybody's going, no, what this was at this date. No, this is at that date. Everybody's like kind of – I think that if you're not in it, like in, in understanding all the, all of it, you we kind of mm-hmm. all forget how it all happened and, you know, it's this yeah, war why? that's just going on. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's like, mm-hmm. okay, there's a war going on, and maybe you don't know all the specifics, you know. So I think – it's it, there's far more than okay. There's a war going on. This is life and death and and people out there fighting. And it's been going on for a long time. And it costs a lot of money and a lot of lives. You know, you've got it. I mean, to me, that's the the thing of everything we talk about, Mike. At the end of the day, with uh, all of this military history, it's people's lives. At the mm-hmm. end of the day, we have to look at that and right. and and respect and on, that's what I say about the honor of it. Um, go ahead, Nancy. Sorry. No, I was just going to say that I think part of why we can sort of not know what's happening as Americans or kind of space out on it a bit is because it's it's rarely on our ground, you know. Um, so we've been to places where bombings happened and um, on our ground, and it's very chilling. But when you okay, the war is overseas in a country that some people don't even know where it is, you know, so it's kind of over there. And it's so right. you, it, it kind of gets clouded that way. If it's in your own backyard, you're a little bit more aware and a little bit mm-hmm. more concerned, you know, a little bit, a lot more. So I think sometimes, um, we forget just I know this is a big world, but it's really not that big when people are fighting over in a different country on your behalf or on democracy's behalf that um, attention should be pointed there a little bit more. But it's hard if you've never been to that country and it's maybe hard to get there in your mind for some people. Mm-hmm. You know, it, if like we lived in Africa, so we're kind of more attuned in a lot of ways to things that aren't totally westernized and American. Mm. And we've seen things happen. We've seen riots. We've seen things happen. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It, so I feel like sometimes um, we don't give enough appreciation to our people in service. Whether they're police or military, we don't give enough appreciation. I don't think you ever can give enough. I don't. I think it's you you just yeah. It you you take it for granted maybe in a bit. Mm. When you live in other countries, call you call try calling nine one one and see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's it's but this but this is the thing. I think she makes a good point here, and the whole point is that you Mm -hmm. don't want it on American soil, right, Mike? At the end of the day, Mm -hmm. we don't want. I keep saying at the end of the day, uh, we, mm-hmm. we don't want this, the the battles on our on our own turf. Uh-uh. No, Mm-mm. no, we don't. It's, and no, so, I, I, I would, yeah, I would say yeah. that we probably had enough of that during the Civil War, and yeah, uh, mm-hmm. yeah we really don't want to, we, we really don't want to have stuff of yeah. that magnitude on our own oh. soil again. 
Yeah. Oh, and and Civil War. I I we got to get you back on the show with that. We got to do Gettysburg and and that area because, oh man, I still can't. You know, war is so rough. You know, you think about like these farmers. Here I am on my pastoral land and wait to the birds chirping and go do this really hard day's work and my kids and then here it is, they're bombing outside your door and your kids yeah. and you are in the basement. How do you tell mm-hmm. your kids it's all good when you don't know if it's going to be all good, you know? Yeah. So it's, a, you know, when you think about that here on our own soil and then you be in different mm-hmm. countries or, you know, and, and it, to me, this is the other thing, 29 palms. I want to get back to that. Um, this, this city, um, you know, the, the Marine Corps base, uh, the Marine Corps air ground combat center, um, it, it Marines apparently from when I was reading it was, they first came to 29 Palms in 1952, and I know blue skies like Yuma, Arizona. Today we're in um, we're in Navarre, Florida, so that plays a role, right, uh, Mike? In in Desert Operation Desert Storm, um, there's all these bases that there was training, and when they're doing training, aren't they trying to replicate what the other countries are like, like trying to put yes. you in the same terrain? Mm-hmm. All the time, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so so it was kind of fortuitous for us because um, the, a lot of the contingencies that we had at the time, and I think uh, even contingencies that we still have, uh, you know, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, we were forecasting scenarios that were going to happen on the plains of Western Europe. We were forecasting scenarios that would happen in North Africa and Mm. forecasting scenarios that were, that might happen in the Middle East. Um, of all the uh, of all the perceived hotspots in the world, we figured that the next most likely high intensity conflict was going to happen in one of those three places. Um, mm-hmm. So, the uh, best available terrain that we had to replicate the conditions and the terrain that we would likely see were in places out in the American West, and that's when you saw a lot of the uh, that's when you saw a lot of the training facilities like. Fort Irwin, California, and mm. 29 Palms, and mm. a, a lot of the maneuver spaces that we have out in the Sierra Nevadas uh, really start to come into their own and get a lot of troop traffic on a rotational basis out there. And it was good for us in the sense that when you have that flat, open desert terrain with uh, a little bit of change in the topography there, you can very adequately train for whether you're going to be in a desert environment, whether you're going to be in a flat open plain environment, or whether you're going to have to deal with various aspects of mountain warfare. Mm -hmm. And we knew at the time, and this really still holds true today, that a lot of our uh, near peer enemies were fighting using Soviet equipment and using a lot of old Soviet doctrines. So we knew that that's how the Iraqis fought. We knew that that's how most of the military mm-hmm. throughout the Middle East fought, and uh, you know even the in even the countries in the latter day Eastern Bloc, you know they were of course all using tactics, techniques, and procedures that uh, came out of the latter day Soviet military. And you even see you even see trends of that today in a lot of the Far East Asian militaries. You know the uh, the the, uh, the Chinese army. Uh, a lot of the uh, militaries in Southeast Asia are still using uh, the order of battle and uh, techniques that you can trace back to the Red Army of the post-World War II era. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And so, hmm. yeah, I mean, this is so here it is, 29 Palms becomes this hot spot for training, like you're saying, all these different places. Um, mm-hmm. I just want to touch on you coming out right T- tell us about the new book yes. cause we're excited we'll, okay we'll do another segment on it but like i mm-hmm. we covered some ground on it today didn't we nice yeah yeah we sure <laughs> did so the new book in the hopper is called days of fury and that is mm-hmm. about ghost troop and the battle of 73 easting and in many ways this is a companion piece uh to a book i wrote about five years ago called the fires of babylon and it was looking at Eagle Troop and the Battle of 73 Easting. Eagle Troop uh, was an armored cavalry troop that was part of the U.S. Army's 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment uh, that was at the tip of the spear 
of the U.S. Army's advance into Iraq during Desert Storm, and they fought at the Battle of 73 Easting. Um, Eagle Troop, uh, it's one of its big, one of, uh, actually among its many claims to fame, is that they uh, destroyed a numerically superior Iraqi armored unit uh, within only 23 minutes without the loss of a single American life. And Eagle hmm. Troop at the time was commanded by a young Captain H.R. McMaster, who later retired as a three-star general and served as the national security advisor under President Trump. Hmm. Wow. Uh, now, now Eagle Troop, however, uh, it was only a, that's only a snapshot of that particular space of the battle. In order to really tell the uh, to give a full picture of the Battle of Seventy Three Easting, I I would I have to talk about what was accomplished by its sister unit, Ghost Troop, which was only a few kilometers north, fighting the very same battle and just fighting a different element of the larger Iraqi Republican Guard unit. And Ghost mm-hmm. Troop uh, had a had a uh, tremendous firefight that they were in. Uh, it was it was just every bit as intense as what the troopers in Eagle Troop faced. And it's uh, very interesting in the sense that you get a different perspective of the same battle that was happening only just a few kilometers north of hmm. where the other unit was. And in the broader sense, it really just shows how superior training, uh, faith in your equipment, and uh, teamwork and, and synchronicity will overcome numerical odds when you're in a modern armored battle. Hmm. Wow. So this is what's so interesting about what you're mm-hmm. doing about this being more modern, right? Um, mm-hmm. In your research with, with these books now, is it different than doing some of the research you've done, like on Hal Moore? I mean, obviously you, you connected with his family and, and um, had mm-hmm. that personal interaction. But uh, when you think about all the, you know, uh, Blackburn, uh, Donald Blackburn, uh, D. Blackburn and uh, Russell Volkman, I mean, going into getting that, history and even some of the, the the recent books you know uh wings of fire you mm-hmm. know the f-15s and right. by the way when we we're in madison wisconsin those those suckers were flying above us the <laughs> F4, f-14s or 15s listen if, when you're in the house it's loud but when you're walking a dog that that no uh-uh that's some loud stuff going on that's some power going on in the skies i don't know what's going on in madison but those things were there we thought of you every time they flew over i'm like there's one of Mike's planes. They're like, hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> is, Mike's planes are going over and saying hi to us. And we're like, what are you doing up there? Um, but, man, you, that that's some power. So it's kind of interesting mm-hmm. how you, all this research you're doing, but doing it more modern. Um, does that kind of connect you also with the service that what you have done and in, in being in the Army? Does that kind of tie back? Do you, do you feel it more, being more modern, like just having done do. service? Yeah, mm-hmm. I do. I mean, myself having been a tank commander, um, a lot of it <laughs> dovetails into my own experiences. And I also think that uh, it's a little more intimate in the sense that uh, the conflict is more recent. It's more within muscle memory and that mm-hmm. the participants are all still very much alive and well. And uh, for them, it was comparatively more recent than say something that happened in Korea or something that happened Mm -hmm. in Vietnam Uh, because a lot of the desert storm vets that I've been interviewing and speaking with, uh, you know, today they're all in their late forties and early fifties, but you know, the average Mm -hmm. age of, uh, of, of that soldier when, when he was in the Gulf, he was, he was probably 19 or 20. And uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, uh, so for them, it uh, it's, it's very real and it, mm. it, it's very recent and, uh, and uh, time hasn't diluted memories to the extent that, uh, you know, you, it might, if you were speaking to a veteran of another conflict. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. I think yeah. that that's the thing about when you are in a military hmm. area, it's always present, right? When you like, yeah. here we are in Navarre, Florida, you, right because we're recording the show with you today is apparently they're doing some kind of training out there and booming us. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of know, booming going on. A lot of booming going on. <laughs> and, you know, we lived in Oceanside and Camp Pendleton boomings and 29 Palms. So, 
you know, you know when you're in a military town, but I think they know, Mike, when you're on a show with us. They're like, Mike's coming on, let's boom it up, you know. <laughs> but, um, but I think you're a little bit more aware. You're around people a little bit more that um, are going through things. Um, so the Gulf War, so the second Gulf War, when did that end, like officially end? Are we, I mean, it got, I got so confused. I mean, when we lived in, even in Twenty Nine Palms, like it was, it was it still going? I mean, because people were still twirling, like going back and forth. Like it was like every that whole community. Um, we're talking about, I'm gonna say the end of like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Mm-hmm. Things were still going on, and I don't know if it's the mm-hmm. same war, but it was, it, it was. It was always a big change, and people were coming and going and doing multiple tours like a lot yeah yeah so a little bit convoluted of a story with that one uh the second gulf war if we're looking at operation iraqi freedom or the iraq war as it's commonly called officially that ended on december 30th of 2011 uh, that was when the last U.S. forces uh, left Iraq as uh, as part of the um, advisory assistance force that we had over there, uh, and we handed off uh, all all military operations to the new Iraqi army. So uh, it lasted from March of 2003 to December of 2011. So mm-hmm. at that point, we thought that we had closed the book on Iraq for good. Uh, you know. Iraq was sovereign, Uh, you know, they had full control over their military. So 2011 ends, Iraq is sovereign, we're all out of there, we just have a residual force in Kuwait. And uh, 2012 seems to be going okay, but then within a few years, you have this thing called ISIS pop up. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that grows out of the, uh, that grows out of the Syrian civil war. Um, Yeah, yeah. Really mm-hmm. twisted, nonlinear story, but as ISIS, you know, starts to grow, they uh, they take over a lot of territories in Iraq. You know, they overrun uh, bases in Mosul, and uh, they keep pushing uh, farther and farther south into Iraq. So while ISIS is causing trouble in Iraq, and they're, you know, encroaching into uh, territory, you know, in, uh, in like the Transjordan and Syria, uh, that's when we say, okay, well, now we're going to kick off a new operation called Operation Inherent Resolve, and it's going to be the uh, airstrikes against uh, ISIS targets in Syria and Iraq, and we're going to redeploy troops to Iraq this time uh, to um, assist the fledgling Iraqi army and the National Iraqi Police Force in combating this uh, this new thing called ISIS, mm. yeah. and uh, yeah, and that's uh, that's why we uh, that's why we now once again have troops over there. But mm. do we ever really leave a place where we've had to go in? I mean, don't we always leave something, somebody, a troop or two, or like just don't we always keep our presence once we've helped a country? Don't we always for have the, some? For the most part, for the most part, we have. There have been mm-hmm. a few exceptions. You know, I mean, we of course had bases in Germany after the Second mm-hmm. World War. Uh, we still have a handful of American bases in Germany today, mm-hmm. uh, far fewer than what we had during the Cold War. But you know, we still have but small still. troop presence there. Uh, yeah. You know, we of course we still have troops in South Korea. Mm-hmm. And uh yeah, and that's what I thought. We, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you know, we, we also we even also um still have troops uh we have troops mm-hmm. scattered throughout the Pacific. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, I think we still have I think I could be wrong on this. I I, I will have to double check myself. I think we mm-hmm. still have an air base and a naval anchorage in the Philippines. Subic Bay, well, but yeah. uh I, I, yeah. I think yeah, because we we always have to you know, like keep watch. You yeah. Know? Well yeah. You, you just have to be aware. So part of being aware is you gotta be there to be aware. So I think we always have you know vestiges of troops. Um maybe smaller, but we're not we're not like getting out all together ever. I don't think we do. 
And and the oh. thing too, like we have these territories like Guam, mm-hmm. the Virgin Islands, yeah. um, you yeah. know, also yeah, I mean all these places we have these, you know, Samoa, we have the American Samoas, uh, you know, these are US territories and they're always mm-hmm. military, right? Um, that we have them there. And that's how our national parks, we have national parks in the Virgin Islands, mm-hmm. we have national parks in Samoa, we have in these territories. It's really interesting how that has happened, but it's, isn't that just like, mm-hmm. okay, we have these sites here, this is kind, it's American kind of, like kind of like Puerto Rico in a weird way. Like, what, mm-hmm. what are we doing mm-hmm. with Puerto Rico, man? This is crazy. We have like a 51st state that's not a state, but they can vote, they can't vote. It's like a weird thing, but it's it's there, but it, isn't this all coming, stemming from we were there at some point through some war, and so now we're going to occupy this one part? Yeah, well, um, Puerto Rico was actually uh, was actually given to us by Spain a- after mm-hmm. a- after the Spanish-American War. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was just like one of the territorial concessions that we got. Um Speaking of, we actually do have a military base on Puerto Rico, Fort Buchanan, yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, of course we got the Puerto Rico National Guard there as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. And most of yeah. the uh, most of the places that we've been militarily, mm-hmm. uh, we keep a presence there you yeah. know, for a variety of reasons. You know, I, I think mm-hmm. the few exceptions have been one Haiti, you know, I mean, we had troops mm. in Haiti, both in the nineties and then after the earthquake mm. and then we left. And then back in the sixties, we had troops in the Dominican Republic and then we left. Mm. And, uh, you know, even after, um, even during the brief time after the Vietnam war, when South Vietnam was still its own country before it fell. Yeah. Um, all mm-hmm. of our troops, except for like a few Marines at the embassy, I think were the only forces we had there still. Uh mm-hmm. huh. I think we again, much, we live. We, but I think it, it's part of being cognizant of what's going on. You know, mm-hmm. you have to have ears on the ground. Uh-huh. That's why I can say it. It's yeah. crazy because, like, no matter what, I swear, Mike, like you are military, Mike. It doesn't matter what we talk about. Here it comes. Like I know this one, <laughs> this, this, this there. I'm like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, dude, seriously, it's like doesn't matter. Now I want to go to Twenty Nine Palms again, uh, the murals there. Okay. So you know, there's a mm-hmm. lot of military yes. murals and murals of the nature, murals of uh, the Native American tribes that have lived out in there. Um, ranching was happening out there. They actually have one of the first, uh, not one of the first, one of the few drive-in theaters mm-hmm. that have been going for is the Smiths, by the way. So maybe my yeah, family so had cool. something to do with it. I don't know. Um, oh, well, actually, no, I actually do have family out there. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's true. We found that out when we moved there. It's like, oh, hello. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so the 20, <laughs> 29 Palms murals. Uh, so Chuck Kaplinger has been on our show a couple of once lately, and then he was actually his work. He's an amazing artist, uh, just incredible artist. And um, he was on the cover of our magazine, our print magazine, way back when, when we were Southwest Blend, covering just the Southwest. And he was in a recent issue of Big Blend Radio and TV magazine. You guys can just go on blendradioandtv.com, type in Chuck. You'll find him. Him, him and his wife, Holgi, was on it, on the show. And um, he painted Desert Storm Homecoming and Victory Parade. Mm-hmm. And it was dedicated in 1995 on October 15th. And they mm-hmm. just recently, you know, uh, finished redoing it. Because, you know, listen, it's hot and sunny in 29 palms and it's part of the reason why there's you know i would say there's maneuvers out there why the military is there because again it's that sense of place and um anyway 29 palms is right outside joshua tree national park it's part of the mojave uh, the whole mojave desert um it's beautiful but it is an art destination as i was saying it's over 60 pieces of public art just in that town and then you've got joshua tree and yucca valley and morongo valley all connected. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really, uh, if you want to do desert, you got to go out there. It is amazing. Um, but the arts, he, he did that, and he said the whole homecoming um, was a big deal. About um, he said many of them were deployed. Uh, when you read the the uh, thing about the uh, mural, um, he said that uh, many of the Marines were deployed during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, mm-hmm. and when came home from the Persian Gulf in 1991, more than 40,000 people crowded into the city for what is known as the Mother of All Victory Parades. 
Um, mm-hmm. That's amazing. I mean, 40,000 people flooding that. It's it's not a city. <laughs> like, you know, Chicago is a city. This is like, it's a city, but it's a town, you know? Yeah. So that's amazing, um, just the pride of people coming home from there. Um, and so, anyway, it's been repainted, and his wife, Hoagie, really helped her, uh, helped him doing that. But listen, Hoagie, this is insane. She's, a, she's an actor, and Mike, she actually participated in trainings um, on, in, on the base. She went in there and played civilian, like, hiding in, like, some of the homesteads and, like, little, like, she she played, like, civilian. Like, they would shoot at her and stuff. You know what I mean? They they would use her, not shoot at her, like shoot at her, but Hello. use her as they, they, I didn't know that the military hired actors to do things in these training things, but apparently that's what she did. She went out on the yeah. base and she would have to dive into water, do this, do that. Um, she's very athletic and that's what she did a, a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, she talked about it on our show. So I didn't know that that happened, you know? I I don't I had no clue, so but that's what she did. So that's interesting. But then, Operation Iraqi Freedom. That's a mural um, that is about on March twenty first, two thousand three. The first Marine Division crossed from Kuwait and began Operation Iraqi Freedom, and it's dedicated to the men and women of the armed forces. I'm reading this uh, mm-hmm. from from the blurb about the mural, especially the Marines and sailors from Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center in Twenty Nine Palms. Um, they are the Marines. I've photographed this a million times. Um, are depicted. It's a hundred foot mural in scenes. It's mm-hmm. taken from actual photographs, including the historic toppling of the forty foot bronze statue of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad yeah. by First mm-hmm. Tank Battalion and the rescue of Shoshona Johnson and seven POWs by the Third LAR. Is it LAR mm-hmm. or LAR? I don't know. But it was painted by Oregon artist Don Gray. So shout out to him for this. This mural, I mean, it's huge. I've, I've, you know, when you photograph it, it becomes this big, long strip. It's so big. And it is about all these different um, different scenes of what happened. So it's, here's this statue coming down. But the rescue of Shoshona Johnson, that was a big deal. I remember that. That was a, that was a big deal, Mike. With, with, and then the mm-hmm. uh, POWs coming in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's our freedom. It sure part. was. Mm. So these guys were all in 29 Palms. And so shout out mm-hmm. to you guys and gals, everybody that was part of that. Um, just it's, I think it's cool when there's murals. Don't you think that kind of saves the history, you know, mm-hmm. of what that town, the people of the town at that time, um, they are part of 29 Palms history. You know, the base is part of that community. And I think the murals tell stories that you just forget about or don't know about, you know, introduce you to, hey, this happened at this time. So just like your work with what you do with your books, Mike, it's important that we keep doing mm-hmm. the art. You. The arts are important. Thank you for joining us again. Everyone, MikeGuardia.com is the website to go to. Um, when do you expect your next book? Tell everybody the name again because, you know, we're excited. Okay. So the name of the book is Days of Fury. Mm-hmm. That is Ghost Troop and the Battle of 73 Easting, and I'm expecting this to be out by the Ides of March. All oh, right. Cool. March, everybody. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And uh, keep tuning in to our first Monday, uh, Military Monday, that's going to be happening here on Big Blend Radio. Keep up with us at BigBlendRadio.com. Again, MikeGuardia.com. We'll go to Amazon. How many books now? I always ask you this, and I'm always like, so what? So many. Wow. How many? 18. Hmm. Wow, Whoa, dude. That's, that's great. One day you're going to be 21, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we want to close, cool. with, with, close with music with Mike, and uh, this uh, this song is called Acatillo. Um, it's a beautiful mm-hmm. desert plant. It's in a euphorbia. Uh, we used to have euphorbias grow around us in Africa, but mm-hmm. this is this unique plant you will find in the Southern California deserts and all the way into Texas. The Acatillo is beautiful. It blooms in the spring and fall when there's rain. Uh, it really it feeds a lot of birds like uh, orioles and hummingbirds and what this pecker. song yeah and I mean this is mm-hmm. I love it but this is for Michael and Spider it's an instrumental from their album uh, from their Smoke and Mirror sessions and it's called Perfume of Creosote and by the way Twenty Nine Palms has some of the best collection of creosotes on the planet the creosote is the oldest and most ancient plant we have in America just so you mm-hmm. know. 
and it is called creosote because it is like oil. Oil, it, it is, it will inflame, but um, they grow in, and I don't want to go into a botany class here, but I, but they're amazing how they grow in these big circular rings and out in Lucerne Valley, just outside 29 Palms, um, it is the most ancient circle of creosote in the planet, just so you know. So anyway, we're going to do a creosote, <laughs> creosote, but it's the Perfume of Creosote album, and you can find it on Bandcamp. Uh, just look up Michael and Spider. So here it is, Ocotillo. Thanks so much again, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, ladies. Always a pleasure to be on the show. Oh, glad to have you. <laughs>